50% of businesses fail in their first two years. So today I'm gonna to teach you how to not be one of them. If you look up the reasons that most businesses fail, it is not that they fail from the outside in, it's that they fail from the inside out. It means that the inside of the business is not strong enough to accommodate the demand that is put on the business. Shit teams, shit leaders, shit accountability. Most leaders have no idea how to hold their team accountable. So they hire a bunch of people, right? Which maybe you've done. And then they're like, these people suck. These people don't get their jobs done. They're not doing anything. Which is why so many of them go out of business from literally not having this one skill. And that is accountability. So what is accountability? It is the quality or state of being responsible to one's obligations. Holding someone accountable means reinforcing them for the actions and results that they produce and that you expect of them. You can think of accountability like if somebody's trying to lose weight, right? And they step on a scale. You are the scale. You are the measurement tool for the people that report to you on the team. And you are the one that's constantly giving them the feedback of where they sit within a range of doing great and doing shitty. And the issue is that a lot of people, what they do is they hire a bunch of people that honestly, most of the time, unless you want to say that everyone in this entire earth is stupid, most of the time they hire decently competent people and then they bring them into their team and then they do nothing. They just say, go do your job. I wrote a job description for you. It's like, okay, you wrote a job description. That's all the, f that's literally what you did. You wrote a job description. How do they know if they're winning? How do they know if they're losing? And that's why so many people are missing this. As a person who leads people, your job, like if nobody's ever told you this, this is actually your job, is to reinforce the behaviors that you want in your team. Reinforce the behaviors that mean that they're winning. And so this is not something that you delegate. You don't like shove this off to your head of HR, to your COO, to your head of sales. Like you are the source of this for the entire company because I can tell you this, nobody in your company will hold people accountable more than the person at the very top. Or a lot of people start businesses because they wanna make money. They have some cool idea they wanna scratch an itch on. Somebody told them that they should do it. They are just looking to not have a job. And because of that, they're not really thinking about the consequences of owning a business, which if you get to a certain size, past a certain point, or want to expand to a certain degree, mean having a team and becoming a leader. And a lot of people aren't able to cross that bridge and close that gap because they don't have the soft skills involved that makes someone a good leader. So I'm sure what you're thinking is, how on earth does this actually end a business? I'll give you a few examples. What I've found in many businesses is that when they lack accountability, they might have half the revenue per headcount as their competitor who does have high accountability. So what does that mean? That means that for me, when I have really high amounts of accountability on my team, it might mean that one team member can support $400,000 in revenue. The other company, that one person supports $200,000 in revenue. Who's gonna win? Who can outspend the other in the marketplace? Your biggest strategic advantage is your team and people. They are the only asset that you have that is appreciating, not depreciating over time. Think about everything you have in business, right? Your product only gets worse over time. Your marketing only gets worse over time. Your opportunity in the marketplace only gets worse over time if you just let them be as is. Whereas most people actually get better over time. And so it makes sense that you would invest in the one thing that is an appreciating asset, which are the people on your team. So you might be thinking, okay, well, what does it even look like to have low accountability on a team? Some of the hard science, like the metrics in your business that would dictate to me, somebody from the outside looking in, possibly like as an investor to look at your business, I'd be looking at, okay, what's your revenue per headcount? Like I said, is it really low? That tells me there's not much effectiveness on the team. There's probably not a great feedback system. There's probably not a lot of accountability. Unclear metrics, because leaders who do not have good accountability don't get people to adhere to filling out metrics. Therefore, a lot of businesses, when I go in and I'm like, can I get the data? And they're like, well, we don't have any data. Let me ask you this. You may not have HubSpot or Salesforce set up, but can you get people to log something on a spreadsheet? If you can't even get a team to log something on a spreadsheet, what does that tell me? It doesn't tell me that you don't have data. It tells me that you don't know how to get people to log data. Third would be hidden expenses, because when there's low accountability, a lot of time what happens in a business is that there's lots of expenses that start to pop up and you're like, where's this coming from? Where's that coming from? The issue is that a lot of people don't adhere to processes and there's no accountability to spending money. And so when people don't have accountability towards spending the company's money, they spend it in ways and in places that you would not necessarily support. And the last two that we're looking at is if there are just generally low conversion rate. So maybe there's high demand. There's lots of leads coming in. You've got lots of eyeballs. You have lots of demand built up for the business, but you're not able to convert that demand into customers. That would tell me that you probably have low accountability on a sales team. I would argue that a sales team is one of the most important teams to have high accountability on because they are 
quite literally like the lifeblood of the business, right? They're taking the eyeballs and converting them into money for the business and that feeds everybody. And the last one would be if you have high churn, right? That can obviously be an indication of product and having a crappy product. But if your product is not crappy and you're like, my product's good, why would you have high churn? A lot of the times, the way that we treat our employees is how they treat our customers. So if you want your employees to treat your customers better, treat your employees better. If you want to keep customers, keep employees. The same practices that you would deploy to keep a teammate are the practices that that teammate deploys to keep a customer. Now on the other side, if you can't relate to any of that, then maybe you can relate to some of this. Oftentimes when there's low accountability on a team, there's lots of complaining. Why is there complaining? Because there's finger pointing, because people also don't know where they stand performance wise. They don't know if they're doing well, if they're not doing well. And so then they point at other people and say, oh, you suck. You're the reason that this isn't going well. You're the reason. And people start to bicker and fight. The second is that you might feel like you resent your team. A lot of leaders that I have interviewed or talked to over the years will come to me and say, my team just sucks. I'm just sick of it. I feel like I'm carrying everybody on my back. And I'm like, well, listen, that's not because you're stronger than everybody else. You don't know how to teach your team to carry the same shit on their backs that you carry on yours, which is accountability. The third is unfinished projects. I would say that follow through, the ability to start and complete a task is a side effect of high accountability on a team. There's nobody measuring them saying, hey, I expect that when you start this thing, you follow through and they're not seeing anything out to completion. Ultimately, what this looks like is you might have a ton of activity on team. Like people are busy. There are meetings on the calendars. There's a lot of communication happening, but you're not making more money. You're not improving your product. You're not increasing the culture or the, I would say, camaraderie on the team. At the end of the day, like you're just not making progress. Accountability is essentially the glue between a commitment and the result, right? Your team can commit to something. If you do not hold them accountable for that commitment, you will not get the result on the other side. So to exemplify the importance of this accountability, back in 2018, when I had a team of 120 people, we were running Gym Launch and Prestige Labs, there was a point where I felt like all of the things I just described to you of feeling like resentful of my team, like I did all the work. Why do I have all these people here? Like I was hiring people and I was making less money. And I took a really hard look at myself and at the team. And the hardest thing to realize was that it was not any one person or any one leader. It was an attribute of our culture that I myself had created, which was there is not a high degree of accountability. The reason for that was that I believed a couple of things. One, I only had the leadership team reporting to me. And I thought, well, leaders who are experienced and older than me and have been doing jobs longer, they don't need me to hold them accountable. That would be weird. And so I allowed them to hold themselves accountable. Then they allowed everyone on their teams who were not older and experienced to hold themselves accountable. And so when I looked at everybody on the team, I was like, the issue is not any one person. There's no silver bullet here. It's that the entire culture needs to shift. And right now, the culture that we have is one where accountability is low. People are given something to do, and then if somebody checks in on it, they say it's micromanaging. Versus having a leader who tells you what winning looks like once you've committed to something, and then lets you know along the way if you're off track or on track. And so the moment that I realized that, I was like, I really need to make this my complete focus. I started putting in systems for accountability end of week reports, communication cycles. I started measuring utilization. The hard part about that, it was such a big change for everybody there. And it was so different than what we'd been doing. A lot of people didn't like it. I had a lot of people leave. I had to let go of a lot of people. And overall, it was a quite a painful experience. And probably the reason that I'm so passionate about it now because uh, I never want to have to go through that again. And the crazy thing is that I went from 120 to 75 with no change in revenue. So the same amount of revenue we were making at that point, which I think at that point was like four and a half, five million a month, we were making when we had 75 people. And people were actually complaining less. We had lower churn, we had higher demand, and everyone was way happier. As much as you may feel like as a boss, oh gosh, people don't want me to hold them accountable. It's like saying you're a fitness trainer, somebody comes to you and says, hey, I wanna lose weight. You watch that they're going off track and they're doing things that would not result in them losing weight and you just don't say anything. And it's like saying, oh, well, if I said something, I wouldn't wanna offend them or make them mad. It's like, what? You're not gonna offend them. You're just trying to help them reach their goal that they already expressed to you. So the same goes for holding people accountable in the workplace. It's really approaching them from a frame of, I'm your partner in this. What's your goal? Where do you wanna get with your career? How can this job help you get there? I'm gonna hold you accountable to doing the things that are going to help you get there in your career. And those things happen to fall within the context of things that also build the business. So to make this real for you guys, let's dissect a common scenario where accountability takes place. There was a study done during the holiday season. 
And the study was basically they took the month of December and they took a group of, I think, 40 and 40. For one group, they had them weigh themselves every day for the month of December. The other group, they had them not weigh themselves at all for the month of December to see what would happen. The group that weighed themselves daily, they didn't diet, they didn't exercise, nothing. They just weighed themselves every day. They lost 1.9 pounds. Now, on the other hand, the group that did not weigh themselves, they gained 4.9 pounds. So what does that tell us? One, you are the scale. There are lots of ways to do things. And there are lots of ways to do things in all the different companies that people are gonna come from. That doesn't mean that you want people to do things in the way that they learned in their last three companies. You are the leader because you have a specific way that you probably know is going to deliver results for this company. So you wanna take what people bring into the organization into consideration. But at the end of the day, you're kind of the one who paints the picture of what good looks like. And then you coach people up to that what good looks like. The second thing, <laughs> is that notice that the scale doesn't yell at you, it's completely neutral. The scale delivers you feedback, which is information that changes your behavior. That doesn't mean that it's bad or good information, it's just information. Do you think that if somebody stepped on the scale and the scale was like, fuck you, you're fat piece of shit, do you think they'd wanna step on the scale again? Probably not. They would probably actually just avoid being measured by the scale. The same goes for if you're a boss giving feedback. If every time your employee turns in a self-assessment or they assess themselves and give it to you and you say, piece of shit, you're not even a five out of 10 here. Do you think that they're gonna wanna give you that assessment again? And if they do, do you think they're gonna tell you the truth? Probably not. They're probably gonna avoid you because you suck. The third thing it tells us, the most effective way to measure accountability is when the person themselves, your employee, your teammate, is the one doing the measuring, not you. So an example of how this would work is that rather than you filling out a rubric of how well somebody did for the quarter, you have a person fill out a rubric that you made where they assess themselves and then they present it to you and then they open it up for you to give feedback. It changes the dynamic from you are pointing out all the problems that this employee has and it switches it to you are now their partner that can collaborate with them on the deficits that they have expressed they see in themselves. Notice that when you step on the scale, it shows you one number. Oftentimes, when people are trying to give feedback to hold somebody accountable, what will happen, I've seen this many times, is that it's, let's say it's a performance review or it's reviewing somebody's like sales call or a uh, customer success call. And then what will happen is like the manager comes with this list of like 17 things that were wrong. You're correct, 17 things were done wrong on that call. Is it useful to hand somebody a paper with 17 things? Do we think they're more or less likely to take action when there are more things on the list or less things on the list to improve? People do much better following simple, short instructions. And so when we give somebody feedback, even when it's them assessing themselves, we wanna make it stupid simple. And so if you're going to focus on giving someone feedback, for example, why not just deliver one thing at a time? It's like when somebody starts out on, again, trying to lose weight. If I say, I'm gonna wake up every day at 5 a.m., I'm gonna go to the gym and lift for two hours. I'm gonna you know, fast until 3 p.m. and I'm only gonna eat vegetables and meat. I'm not gonna go out and I'm not gonna drink. How likely do you think it is that that person who before this has been watching Netflix and eating popcorn is going to do all of those things immediately and not fudge up on any of them? But if we say, hey, let's just commit to not drinking alcohol and not eating dessert. Let's just do that for the first two weeks. That person is probably much more likely to adhere to the program. It's pretty easy to not do that for a couple days. And then once you've done that for a couple days, you notice, oh, I'm winning and you start to feel good. And people who feel good are more likely to stick with the plan because they get reinforced by the good feelings from sticking to the plan. And then once they've done it for long enough and it becomes a habit that is reinforced on its own by just doing it rather than even the positive feelings, then you can add on another habit that they can stick to. The same goes for changing behavior of an employee. If you have someone who has a lot of things they need to work on, give them one at a time. Allow them to make progress on one thing before you add 16 other things. I want to tell people what I want them to go towards, not away from, right? And the thing is, is if you paint a very compelling picture of what you want people to go towards, the behaviors that would take them away from it just kind of start to die off because they're so focused on this thing, they kind of forget about all this stuff over here. And if you look at ironic process theory, most people, when you tell them not to do something, think about it more. This is why telling somebody with anxiety, for example, who gets a lot of anxious feelings, stop thinking about all these catastrophic events, they're probably gonna think about them more and then be anxious about the fact that they're thinking about them more. And it's a self-perpetuating cycle. The same thing happens in performance. If you point out to an employee, hey, you really fucked up here. 
Johnny. Like that sales call was shit. This can't happen again. What's gonna happen is this. Johnny, if he actually gives a shit about his performance, which most people do, and most people are actually doing their best, he's probably gonna walk away from that conversation and think, holy shit, I really suck at sales. He actually might've thought beforehand, he didn't even suck that bad at sales. He's like, wait, I'm like the third best on the team, but they just told me this. So now he's gonna feel a little bad about himself. And now he's gonna look at the call, and he's gonna think about what you said, but then he's gonna say, what did I suck at? And the reason that Johnny can't decipher and he actually ends up staying stuck and if anything, regressing. You gave him very vague negative feedback, which is what a lot of bosses do. They might say something like, your tone on the sales call sucks. Okay, well, that tells me what you don't want, but I have no idea what you do want and I don't know what to do to even get to where you would want. What do I need to do differently? So if you want someone to keep fucking up, tell them where they're fucking up because they won't know what you want going forward and they won't know what to do to even move forward if they wanted to try. That's why the most effective way to give positive reinforcement, which is accountability in this instance, is to tell someone what you would like them to move towards. One better is that you get them to tell you what they want to move towards, right? And then you just get to give any feedback that they ask for extra on top of that. The ultimate is if, again, you can put in place measurement systems like end of week reports, KPIs, rubrics, where they can assess themselves and then present it to you. But the second best is that you remind them of where you would like them to get to, right? And tell them stories, give them a compelling vision, and then tell them how to get there step-by-step. Step. Do you encourage your team towards a better behavior or do you threaten your team away from a negative one? Threaten away from a negative, encourage towards a positive. This one will beat this one at any point in time. The difficulty, if you're listening to this and you're like, this sounds like a bunch of hippy dippy bullshit, is that this one works really well in the very short term. If somebody is on a meeting and they're talking over you and you say, you need to stop talking or this is a third strike for you, that person's gonna shut the fuck up. But then they're gonna avoid you. They're gonna start looking for another job. They're gonna talk behind your back to other employees about how you're an asshole. Like no loyalty. And so if you really want to hold people accountable, you encourage them towards a future vision. Now, when we talk about accountability, there's actually two types of accountability that I think exist in a business, okay? There is tactical accountability and there is developmental accountability. Tactical accountability is much more of reinforcing somebody for the behaviors that have more to do with the hard skills of the job. So like, did you do this thing in the proper order at the proper time, according to the job description, right? And so this might be like, did you turn in your end of week report on time? Did you fill out your rubric the way that it's supposed to be filled out? And so all of those things are tactical accountability, which are, I would say like where more people do well is holding people accountable to these things, which is like, hey, you know, thank you so much for filling that out. And next time when you fill it out, even could you do this as well? You know, it's just always like encouraging them towards the future vision. I think people can get that one down pretty easily. Developmental accountability is much more of reinforcing soft skills that I would say are like the underlying skills needed to execute the hard work. Examples of this would be reinforcing when they positively reinforce their team, reinforcing when they are transparent and honest, reinforcing when they express a problem they see, reinforcing when they are kind to another employee, reinforcing when they don't complain, reinforcing when they take on a lot of work and you know it's a lot to juggle. So it's reinforcing the much broader behaviors that are far less tactical that you watch them exhibit in the organization. So the key for that piece with the developmental is you wanna know ahead of time, like when someone enters the organization, what have they been doing in their past roles that has been considered successful that would not be considered successful in the current role they're coming into? And then once you have that, it's so much easier to go from there because a lot of times what happens is that you can see something during the interview process or even during the first 90 days, but you don't bring it up because you're scared. You're like, oh, I don't wanna tell them that this thing. And then what happens is that over time it gets worse and it starts to conflict with more and more areas in the business and you continue to avoid it because you've reinforced yourself for avoiding it. And the more we avoid something, the more scary it becomes. And then eventually what you end up doing is just firing the person because you're like, ah, oh, they can't change this thing. But the reality is that you never addressed the thing that they couldn't change and then never talked about a plan to reinforce them for the new thing. And if you can teach somebody something, which I would hope if you're running a business, you can, then that is a huge advantage for you because a lot of people have behaviors that can be extinguished after one or two months if you teach them properly. If somebody, for example, came into my organization and they said, Layla, I really wanna understand how you build and manage and scale teams, but I've been in places where, honestly, they've just told me I can yell at people. I'd say, great, what we're gonna work on is instead of yelling at people, you're gonna do this instead. You're going to message me every time you wanna yell at somebody, and I'm gonna help you script out what you're gonna do instead. <laughs> it's funny, this could apply to your personal life as well. Say you just broke up with an ex-boyfriend, and then you have a thought, I wanna text him. 
Instead, text your best friend. You wanna give somebody a replacement behavior. So an example for tactical is that, say a teammate misses their end of week report. They're supposed to turn it in at Thursday at 5 p.m. PST. You don't see it, it's Friday morning, 9 a.m. You reinforce this for them by doing a couple things. You say, hey, let's put a reminder on your calendar. So that's like the tactical operational piece of this. The next piece is that you encourage them and reward them for all the times they do turn it on time. Even if it sucks, even if it's not filled out right, you reward them for the fact they got it in on time. This is what happens, this is from their perspective. They turn in their report, you yell at them. They now associate turning in the report with being yelled at. The likelihood that they wanna turn it in, in the future is low. You ever had a parent that's like, why don't you call me more? And you're like, mom, I don't call you more because every time I call you, you tell me how I don't call you. Same shit. On the other side, we have developmental accountability. An example of this would be, there's a lot of people that join the workforce who get by by just being likable. Everyone loves them, but like low execution, not very effective. You reinforce their likability by giving them more attention to others on the team, talking to them more frequently, entertaining their ideas. What we wanna do is we wanna take all the energy that you give to reinforcing them being likable, and we wanna switch it over to reinforcing any little thing they do that drives results. And what you'll see is that over time, they will shift their behavior from doing all the things just to be liked to doing all the things that drive results. It's kind of like a comedian. If you ever see a comedian go on stage and it's like, they make a joke and then nobody laughs. You can just see that suddenly they get less and less confident in making the jokes. That person is up there literally being paid to make jokes. The likelihood that they make good jokes after that is low. If somebody does a behavior or exemplifies something in your company that you don't want more of, extinguish it by just not responding, not reacting. I will never punish by making a face or making a noise that's going to like give any sort of feedback. I just nothing, blank stare neutral. If you have teammates who exemplify behaviors that you don't want, write down what those are and then decide to ignore them. And instead take your energy into where they're doing things you want more of and reward them for that all day. So the question is, why is there such a large void of this in business? And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that people generally don't like giving people feedback because they have a negative association with it. Because most places teach you how to give feedback in a way that is not giving feedback. It is insulting people. Of course you don't want to insult people. Insulting people does not change their behavior. It just makes them hate you. Giving someone feedback makes them like you more and change their behavior. And so the reason that so many people have a hard time giving feedback and holding people accountable is because they've been taught wrong. And to be honest, most people do it wrong. Almost all the organizations I talk to do it wrong. They all think, have that hard conversation, give them the critical feedback. And you're like fucking hyping yourself up. And you're like, I'm gonna fucking have this conversation. And then you like get there and you're like, here's it, here it is. And then they're like crying. And then a week goes by and nothing has changed. It's like, yes, because you got on a call and you just told her why she sucked for 30 minutes. She's not gonna do anything different. She just knows that she sucks and she has no idea what to do to get better or even what better looks like. Giving feedback is providing someone with information that will change their behavior. If it has not changed their behavior, then it is not feedback. The most effective way that I have found to give feedback is this, self-assessing, okay? Because self-assessment is number one. If you can get somebody to assess their own behavior and present it to you, that is king above all else. Second best from there is what I like to call share the facts and state the truth. So number one, state the facts of what happened in a neutral way. And when I say facts, this means that there can be no opinion woven in here. If an alien came down to earth and stated the facts of what happened in this instance, he would have no opinion. So you want to state the facts with absolutely no bias. On Monday, you showed up to the meeting 30 minutes late. That's a fact, right? Anyone who came in and was on the meeting would be able to state that. Then you ask the person what they think about that fact. What do you think of that? All of a sudden, they're the one that's like beating themselves up. You are going to guide them towards a productive solution. Great. Hey, it happens. Not a big deal. It's not the end of the world, man. I've been late to meetings too. But what do you think we can do next time to make sure it doesn't happen again? Ask them for their idea. And then the most important part is that you have follow through in that the next time when they do the corrective behavior, you reinforce that behavior. Great job being on time for all your meetings today. Like, love it. Awesome. Such a good job. You may feel like a kindergarten teacher doing this, but I swear to God, it works. And the simpler, the better. You can give a thumbs up. You can give a high five. You can give a pound. It doesn't matter what it is. I actually think that hand gestures are the most effective. If you're remote, a giant smile. Great job. Air five. Love it. The more vague a 
positive responses, it's sometimes the better because they get to interpret it however they want. Here's another example. Let's say you have a salesperson and they're underperforming. State the facts. Last week, your close rate was 20% below what it's normally been. What do you think of that? Great. So what could we do to increase your close rate? Great. How can I support you in fixing that? You become their comrade rather than their dictator. And then the next time that they increase their close rate, because maybe they identified, you know, hey, actually, I realized I didn't stick to the script this week. You're not even going to reinforce the fact that they close somebody next. You are then going to reinforce, hey, by the way, fucking fantastic job. Those three calls yesterday, you stuck to the script in each one. I don't even care if it closed or not. Great job sticking to the script. Because what do we know? We know that if they stick to the script, eventually they'll close the deal. So here's the thing that I want to reinforce here. Most employees' behaviors come from their past experiences. Either they've been rewarded for them or they have been effective in driving results. If we don't reinforce the new behaviors that we want now in this job, old behaviors we shall get. So here's what I want to do. I want to make sure that you never end up as one of those 50% businesses that goes out because you can't build a team and hold them accountable. And so I've broken this down into a formula that I hope is as easy as possible to understand so you know exactly what you need to do when you get off this video, get off your couch or out of your bed, and you go back to trying to hold your team accountable. The accountability formula is expectations plus measurement times reinforcement equals accountability. Let me break that down for you. Expectations are essentially the instructions that you give somebody, a job description, a core value, an SOP, a brand promise, a departmental promise, role expectations, company mission, behaviors you want them to exemplify, instructions you want them to follow, processes you want them to adhere to, instructions. Expectations are instructions. The second piece is measurement. How do we know that they are doing or not doing the instruction or expectation is by measuring those things. And so measurements can look like timelines, uh, project management boards, KPIs, MBOs, surveys, utilization metrics. I want you to do these things. Here is how I will measure those things. Now, the last step is the only thing, and it's the most important thing to both of these, which is reinforcement. Reinforcement is essentially what you do after you receive the measurement. You give them the instruction or the expectation. You measure the thing. They hand you the measurement or you measure the thing. What happens next? Do you applaud them? Do you give them a high five? Do you yell at them? Do you tell them what you want differently? What happens after the thing is measured is reinforcement. And so if you want a high degree of accountability in a company, then you will provide a high amount of reinforcement. The amount of reinforcement you provide dictates the strength of accountability in a company. The less reinforcement that you give somebody, the lower the degree of accountability, even if you have the instructions and the measurement, the higher the degree of reinforcement you give them, the higher amount of accountability you will have. And now again, within reinforcement, that in itself is a neutral word. Specifically, if you want to build a company the way I build one and not have everyone live in fear, then you would use positive reinforcement because there is negative reinforcement that also works the same way, but it doesn't work as well in the long run. And so for this sake of this video, we talk about positive reinforcement. The more positively you reinforce the measurements going in the direction you want, the more that you get that behavior. Self-assessment is king above all. You set the expectation, you create a self-measurement tool, they fill out that measurement tool, you reinforce them filling it out and the metrics that you like seeing. That is it. That is the best way to reinforce and get more of the behavior you want in a company. So here's an example of this that I actually use in my own company, okay? So I've got, here's our core values. We've got unimpeachable character, sincere candor, competitive greatness. And then I have a self-assessment that they fill out that says, rate yourself on a scale of one to 10 on how you exemplify these values. Here's what the values mean. And then they turn that into me and then we get to talk about what they can do to improve. 